Well, uh, perhaps you all face this crossroads like many families over the last few days, this past week. And the crossroads were this. With all the recommendations that the CDC and other organizations are giving regarding traveling during the holidays and COVID and the spread of COVID and having guests and friends and family come, you had to make a decision about whether you were going to go home or invite people over or what you were going to do for Thanksgiving. And perhaps, uh, like our Thanksgiving, it looked very different for you all than it has in the past. And today what we're going to look at is this. Uh, Jesus is now wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount, and he's going to give us four contrasts between righteousness and wickedness, or this what we call narrow path or the wide path today, He's going to give us four contrasts as a choice, a crossroads that we're at as his followers, as kingdom citizens, or for some of us perhaps today who've yet to put our faith in Christ. As people, we face a crossroads. We have to make a choice. Or like in the movie The Matrix with Morpheus, when he has the blue pill and the red pill and he's with Neo, played by Keanu Reeves. You want to enter the Matrix or not? You have the blue pill and the red pill. You can keep doing what everyone else is doing, or you can make a choice to enter into the matrix and see real truth, real reality, really what's going on. And so Jesus is ending the Sermon on the Mount saying, after all that we've looked at over the last few chapters, five, six, and now at the end of chapter seven, I'm gonna give you four contrasts as both you making a choice, but also as a warning, saying, you know what? You can continue to live as a kingdom citizen to follow the rule and submit to Jesus Christ and enjoy what we would call the abundant life, which was in the prayer of so many of the parents that we prayed today, or you can choose to live your own life. As a warning, he's showing us where that's gonna go. So if you have your Bibles, we're gonna look at this crossroads in front of us, this choice in front of us in Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14. Just two verses today. If we're gonna fulfill the golden rule, if we're gonna live out the Beatitudes, if we're gonna submit to Jesus King, not just today, but every day of our lives, what's the crossroads? What are the choices in front of us? He says this in Matthew 7, 13, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. You can underline that word many. For the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life, and there are few who find it. You can underline that word few. So he's comparing the many and the few, the majority and the minority today. And so here's point number one. The majority have entered the path of destruction. The majority have entered the path of destruction. Where do I get that from? He says, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. That word enter in the Greek is in the middle or passive, which seems to indicate that they're already on this path, that they've been placed on this path. It's not a choice that they've made. They've entered because that's where they find themselves in. And that's what Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3 would indicate to us is that we're all born in that condition. John 3, 17 through 21 would say the same thing, that Jesus Christ didn't come to the world to condemn the world. Why? Because apart from Jesus Christ, we're already condemned. And so he says here in the text in verse 13 that this path is wide. The gate is wide and the path is wide. Verse 13, that word wide is a Greek word platea, from which we get the English word plate, like a dinner plate that you probably enjoyed over Thanksgiving. It means flat and open. So he says, this path of destruction that we are on, he says, is wide open. It's flat. There's no barriers or obstacles. It's, it's that picture of Thanksgiving having that big plate in front of you that you can just stuff a whole lot of food on. The opportunity is there. And then he says, the way is broad. The road that this gate follows is broad, and that word broad is a Greek word, eurus, from which we get the English word Europe, and it means really broad, and the word Europe means a broad face. So he says, the majority have entered this path to destruction. Look at Philippians 3. I read this this morning in my devotions. Philippians 3, verse 17. Philippians 3, 17. Again, contrasting the few and the many, the majority and the minority. Philippians 3.17 says this, Brothers and sisters, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, again, there's that word many, of whom I often told you and now tell you, even as I weep, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, 
whose end is destruction, just like it says in verse 13, destruction, whose God is their appetite or their stomach, whose glory is there in their shame, who have their minds on earthly things. Verse 20, for our citizenship as followers of Christ is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Advent right there. We're waiting, we're hopeful. He says, who will transform the body of our lowly condition into conformity with his glorious body by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. So in this text here, Jesus says, again, many, they follow after their own gods, the God of their appetites, a the God that's gonna lead them to destruction. He says, that's the wide path. But he says, for those of us who put our faith in Christ, we're hopeful because he's coming again. That's what Advent is. He came the first time, born in a manger, but he's coming again, and we're hopeful because Christ is coming. So again, point one is this. The majority have entered the path to destruction, and this is how we're led there because there's a God of this world. Uh, when I was in college, uh, I studied animal science, and I studied food science as well. I was hoping to feed the hungry of the world, and God changed and redirected my life to now feed people spiritually, not just physically. But I remember in a class, I learned about something called the Judas goat or the Judas steer. And you're wondering, what is a Judas goat or a Judas steer? Is because when the animals, the steer or the sheep or the goats are getting off that truck and they're entering in the slaughterhouse. Now, can you imagine being a sheep or a goat or a steer and you can hear the cries of all these animals being slaughtered. Perhaps you can even smell the blood of these animals being slaughtered. So it's not natural for you to think I'm getting out of this truck and I'm heading for destruction. So what they do is they have Judas goats or Judas steer that are trained solely to once they get out of the truck or the loading truck, they walk down the path and this is what happens. The rest of the flock, the rest of the herd follow after the Judas steer. Right before they get to the slaughterhouse, the Judas steer is let out and he goes to the side and the rest of the animals enter the slaughterhouse. And that's what the God of this world has done. He's blinded us, he's deceived us. And so again, the wide gate, it's flat, it's wide open, that leads to destruction. This path, this broad path leads to destruction. But Jesus says, as followers of the kingdom, we have an alternate path. He says this in verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, the narrow gate. The Greek word there, narrow, is the word steen. The Greek word steen, from which we get the English word stenographer, someone who writes narrowly. Whatever is heard, they write down. It means narrow, it means small. He says, enter through the small gate. Why, verse 14, for the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life. So he says, you have a choice before you. Destruction or life, majority, destruction, minority, life, and there are few who find it. So here's point number two. A minority enter the kingdom and keep walking by faith. We enter the gate, this narrow gate, this one-way gate by faith, and we keep walking on this narrow path by faith. Now you're asking, what is that gate? Jesus tells us in John 10 that he's the gate. In John 14, six, he says he's the way. So he is the way, he's the gate. In Acts 4.12, it says there's no other name under heaven by which people are saved. And so the gate that we enter the kingdom, that narrow gate, that one-way gate, that very exclusive gate, is simply faith in Jesus Christ. And then he says, once you get in the gate and now you're on the path, he says, stay on it by walking by faith. And here's the interesting thing about that path. He says that path is narrow. Again, it's that word steen, from which you get things for stenographer. And it's also, verse 14, constricted. It means like a boa constrictor. It's squeezed. The Greek word is thipsis. And so the indication there is this, that as you walk on that narrow path that leads to life, let me ask this. How many of y'all want destruction? Anybody want your life to end in destruction? Anybody in here? How many of y'all want to have your life end in life, like you want to get to life, like real life in Jesus Christ, the abundant life that these parents up here prayed for? He says, if you're on that path, one thing is you're going to find that it is constricted, flipsis, it's pressure, which indicates external persecution, external persecution. You're going to feel pressure from the world. In Genesis chapter six, we also find again, it's those who entered into the ark. In Elijah's case, in 1 Kings uh, 19, we see the faithful remnant. 
that as you live as this faithful minority on this path, you're going to experience persecution, ridicule, mockery. You're going to have pressure. So here's the thing, um, and this is true not only of every single believer who says, I put my faith in Jesus Christ, I submit to his lordship, his kingship, and I'm on this path that leads to life. You're gonna experience pressure, you're gonna experience stress, you're gonna experience persecution. This is true of every kingdom endeavor, every kingdom endeavor. That if you as a husband, and we prayed for several fathers and husbands up here, if you as a husband say, I wanna be a kingdom man, I wanna be a kingdom husband, you're gonna find the majority of husbands around you don't want that. The majority of fathers around you don't want that. Matter of fact, here's the thing. Your boss most likely doesn't want that as well. If you have to make a choice and you have buddies who are gonna go golfing and spend four or five, six hours on Saturday to go golfing and you away from your family and you say as a kingdom husband, as a kingdom father, you know what? I'm gonna sacrifice that. I know my wife has been busy all week and this is like her only day off and so you know what, rather than going golfing, I'm gonna choose to sacrifice my Saturday and I'm gonna help clean the house or do whatever my wife needs done around the house. You know what, my daughter has a ballet recital on Saturday. Would I prefer going golfing than sitting through a bunch of six-year-olds dancing and prancing? Of course, but you know what, I'm willing to sacrifice that. I'm willing to leave work early today and not take on another project. Is your boss gonna like that? Probably not. And so again, the way that leads to destruction is broad, but the way that leads to life is very narrow and it's constricted. Same thing as a kingdom single. If you say, you know what, I'm gonna remain, remain sexually pure until I get married. I'm gonna do things God's way. You're gonna experience constriction. If you choose to live your life as a kingdom single, you're gonna experience the stress because you're gonna go against the flow of where our culture is going. As a kingdom wife or a kingdom uh, mom as well, you're gonna experience the same thing. You're gonna experience that constriction because you're going against the flow. You're going against the flow. Um, good friend of ours, she's now a captain, I think, or some high-ranking police officer in the Arlington Police Department in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. And many years ago, she was helping us with our cause ministry. Her brother was in our cause ministry. And so she said, hey, it's end of the year. I actually do security part-time at uh, Six Flags over Texas in Arlington, the amusement park. At the time, my wife and I were newlyweds, and she said, hey, as a gift to you all, I wanna give you free passes to Six Flags over Texas. Anybody been there before? Anybody Six Flags over Texas? And so I don't know if you know this, um, but I, I thought to myself, as big as that park is, with as many employees they have in food service and as hosts and as amusement park rider people and all that, they must have like multiple entrances, like the secret entrance for the staff, and then an entrance for like the guests. And she said, no, just meet me at the front. There's only one entrance to the entire amusement park. And so we met her at the front gate where all the guests came in. And so the guests, employees, the staff, everyone came in through that one narrow gate. And that's a great picture of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is exclusive in terms of how you enter the kingdom of God. It's only through Jesus Christ, Christ alone. But the kingdom of God is also inclusive in the sense that it includes every culture, every ethnicity, every gender, every socioeconomic class, because it's exclusive through Jesus alone, but it's inclusive in that it welcomes everybody through this narrow one gate, Jesus Christ. But again, you are going to go against the flow. Here's the stats. About 31% of the world, 31% of the world identifies Christians, 31% of the world. Of that, about 66%, two-thirds, identify as either Orthodox or Catholic. The other, one-third, identifies Protestant. Now, in that mix, I'm sure there are people who look into their works for salvation who are not Christians because they're looking to their works. I'm sure there are cultural Christians in that mix. But overall, I don't know the numbers. But even 31%, that's still a minority worldwide, and probably even a smaller minority, if you, again, add in cultural Christians and people who look into works for, uh, works for salvation, so in the world, we are a minority. We're a minority. And if you ever go on the Voice of the Martyrs website, you know that in the last 100 years, more Christians have been killed for their faith in Jesus Christ than in the 1900 years before that. And so persecution is on the rise. So again, he says, when you go against the flow, when you enter that narrow path, he says, you're gonna go against the flow, you will experience 
that squeezing or persecution. So let me give you four, uh, uh, four uh, applications here. Number one is this. We will be persecuted. We will be persecuted. Write that down. We will be persecuted. So make sure that you know that mockery, persecution, ridicule is normal as a Christian. If you are living your life under the lordship of Jesus Christ, under the kingship, if Christ is your president every single day and you live in this broken, fallen, selfish world, you're gonna be going against the flow. And that's uh, number two, point number two, or application number two. We'll be going against the cultural flow. You'll be going against the cultural flow. There's a book called Disruption by Mark Demas. He came out with this about two or three years ago. I heard him speak here in Houston. And Mark Demas says this, that religious liberty in America is gonna decrease more and more regardless of who's in office. You're gonna see less and less religious liberty in America. And it's gonna be the point where you can Every, every other faith is off limits, but you can continue to persecute Christians. That's what he says. We're gonna lose our tax-exempt status, both as donors and as churches. So the church is gonna be taxed, and you're not gonna have tax-exempt status on your, what you can give or your uh, tax write-offs on what you give. And because of that, he says we're gonna be disruptive, and he's calling for churches to look at ministry in a different light. Continue to be faithful to God and all those things, but the religious liberty is gonna begin to decrease. We're gonna experience more and more either passive or active persecution. And with that also, we'll be going against the cultural flow. We're gonna be like salmon who are going back to lay eggs. We're gonna be going against the flow. We're gonna be like that passenger. Have you ever been there before where you're on a, a plane and they're about to uh, deboard, they're about to get off the plane, and as you get off the flight, everyone is going down the aisle one way, and as you're going down the aisle, you said, man, I forgot my cell phone. Have you ever lost something and had to go back to your seat? He says, that's what it's gonna be like to be a Christian. You're gonna feel like at work, at school, that you're going against the flow. A good friend of mine, she's single, and she said, Icky, I'm very frustrated. I said, why is that? She said, because I'm on this dating site. And I said, okay. And she said, I'm trying to find a mate. I really desire to be married. And they ask all these questions on there. And I said, okay. And she said, you know, it's about your temperament and what you enjoy, your hobbies, and all these things, and she said, one of the questions on there is this, is are you okay with engaging in premarital sex? And so they said on this Christian dating site that something like two-thirds of the respondents said it was okay. And by the fact that she said, I'm not okay with it, her pool of eligible singles decreased dramatically. And she said, I feel like I'm going against the flow. I feel like I'm going against what culture has now said is acceptable. Take it for a test drive, right? And she said, I feel like my chances of getting married are slim to none. And I said, but who's the one that finds you mate? Is it the service or is it the Lord? And I believe that God honors faithfulness. So again, second application is we'll be going against the cultural flow. And we're going to see that more and more as the days go on. But here's the things that we need to do. If we're going to be persecuted and going against the cultural flow, third application is this. We must be united. We must be united. We must be united. And we've seen that in the world of sports, right? You know that a team is headed for trouble when they're no longer united. When they face opposition every Saturday or every Sunday or whenever they play, when they begin to break down and don't have that unity and that harmony, they're in trouble. And we've seen that when locker rooms crumble. But here's the thing I really miss about sports as a former athlete. And I asked the Rockets this, another team, I think it was the Pelicans when I did chapel for them, I said to them uh, about a year ago, I said, hey, when you retire one day, what do you think you're gonna miss the most? Minus the paycheck and the fame and all that stuff. What do you think you're gonna miss the most? And they're all going around, and this was a consistent answer I heard, and this is my answer. And this is, if you played high school sports or junior high sports or college sports or even professional, maybe you miss this too. I miss being on a team. I miss the camaraderie. I miss getting up at 5 a.m. to go work out. And the workouts weren't fun, but at least you're in the weight room joking around, having a good time. I miss the bus rides and the plane rides. I miss having like a common opposition. I miss having a common goal that we can all work towards, whether it's a conference championship or a championship of some sort or just winning the game. I miss those things. And to a T, all the players around the room said, that's what I miss the most. The plane rides, the camaraderie, the harmony, the unity, working for a championship. 
And as a church, that's what we are. We're God's team. We're God's family. And we should be united and enjoy being with one another, working towards a common goal, which is pursuing Jesus Christ, right? Following him as disciples and making disciples, loving God and loving our neighbor. That should be our common goal. And you know what? We all have a common enemy as well. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter one and two that there's a kingdom of light and a kingdom of darkness. We have opposition. And rather than fighting one another and biting and scratching at one another, we have to remember that we have a common enemy. Amen? Amen. Is it just me that believes that? And so we must be united. And lastly, number four, we must encourage one another. We must encourage one another. Hebrews is a book all about Christians who are being persecuted. They're Jewish believers, people who came out and became Christians, and because of that, they have a temptation during persecution to go back to their Jewish ways. If following Jesus Christ was this tough, this difficult, this discouraging, man, I should just go back to living how I used to live. It's so frustrating and angering and discouraging and downright depressing. And so in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, the writer Hebrews says to them who are being persecuted and all of us, do not forsake gathering together. Don't stop meeting together in community groups and worship settings like this. Why? Because when you go out in the world and at school, you're a minority going against the cultural flow. You're gonna experience persecution, ridicule. People are gonna pour salt into your game. So you have to gather and come to a place where people know you and love you and you can also love and know them. And then he says this in verse 25, encourage one another, encourage one. So you gather, don't stop doing that, whether virtually through Zoom during COVID or whether you do it in community groups or here on a Sunday. He says, don't stop doing that, but he says, when you get together, encourage one another. You're going against the flow. You're tired. The world is gonna discourage you. Our broken, selfish world is gonna sap you of courage. So he says, when we get together, pour courage in. Encourage one another. Send that brother or sister in Christ a text message saying, I'm praying for you. Send them that Bible verse as the Spirit says, you know what, encourage them with that verse. We need to be encouraging one another. So that's the fourth thing. If we're on that narrow path, We've entered by faith, encourage one another. We need to encourage one another. Many years ago, when I was much fitter than I am today, about five, six years ago, I was asked to run the longest relay race in America. It's the Capitol Coast. It goes from Austin to Corpus Christi. You you can do it in a team, I think, as small as six and up to like 10. And so it's 223 miles, and we ran it with eight people. So over the course of about a day, we ran the equivalent of a marathon broken up into four legs. And so I ran like eight miles, six miles, whatever the legs were. And here's the thing. Everyone who's in that race, there's all these teams. We start right there by the Capitol in Austin, and we run all the way down to the coast in Corpus Christi. And there's little rest stops along the way, but you're running, and you're always running against traffic. I don't know if you run against traffic, but we always run against traffic. Some shoulders are really wide, others are narrow. Some cars just pass you very peacefully. Others are honking at you. They swerve into you just to mock you and all that stuff. And so you're running in the middle of the night. The year I ran it, it was like cold like today. It was raining and windy, and it was miserable. And so this is what I made a goal to do. My goal was not just to win the race. I didn't want to just finish, although our team, mixed uh, mixed, uh, gender team, came in first place. Humble brag, right? Um. My goal that day was everyone who I came across, knowing that we were all running from Austin to to Corpus, 223 miles, the longest relay race in America, cold, windy, miserable, against traffic. I said, I'm gonna encourage everyone I come across. And that's what I did. As I was running along, and I'd see somebody, and and this is how it was. It was like 12 o'clock, midnight, I'm running, it's pitch black, rain in my face, we got a little light on our heads. And in the distance, I'd see like a little red light bouncing. And just the competitor in me says, I'm gonna catch that person. So I'd run and catch that person. And rather than taunting them or whatever, saying, hey, I just passed you and beat you, I'd say, hey, keep going. You can make it. Go for it. Keep going. Keep pushing. Because 
Our goal was, the common goal, was we wanted to get to Corpus. And you know what? That's how I almost envision the church, that our denominations and churches are these little teams. We're all running towards the same goal. We're all running on the same path, this narrow path against the flow known as life. So if I can encourage you with this, encourage one another. Encourage one another. Find opportunities. Pray that God would show you ways that you encourage people here at Bayou City Fellowship, other Christian coworkers, other Christian students, other Christian med students, that you can encourage one another because living in this world and going against the cultural flow often, if not always, is downright discouraging. Amen? Amen. So here's a big idea for today. Enter and keep walking by faith. Enter and keep walking by faith. Enter through Jesus. Enter the kingdom through Jesus Christ. And everything that we've learned, chapter five, six, and seven, if you're gonna practice those things, obedient to the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, he says it's gonna be difficult, but it's gonna lead to life. Life as God intended life to be lived in this broken, fallen, selfish world. You're gonna experience squeezing. You're gonna go against the flow. You're gonna feel like that passenger who left their cell phone back 20 rows in the airplane, and you have to go against the flow and it's gonna be discouraging. So therefore, he says, stay united, stay connected, and also encourage one another. And all the more as you say that, see the day drawing near. What's that day? That day is when Christ comes back. And that's why Advent is so special. Advent is special because we remember the first coming of Christ, but we're hopeful that Christ is coming back for us. Jesus Christ is waiting for us in Corpus Christi, waiting for us at the finish line with his arms wide open. We're waiting for Christ to come and take us home. Um, Next Sunday, uh, Ryan Vinzant, our youth pastor, is gonna be preaching here. Uh, I've got a wedding coming up this weekend in Lafayette, Louisiana, so I'll be out of the state, I guess, out out of town. And then on Tuesday, I'm doing another wedding, so I've got a very busy wedding season coming up over the next uh, week, week and a half. So Ryan will be preaching um, next Sunday. And also, a note, We're gonna serve coffee next Sunday at 11 a.m. So for the coffee lovers, we'll have coffee again. I'm like, Jesus coming back, put our hope in Jesus. I was like, okay, that's nice. Coffee's coming back. Yeah, coffee's coming back. Woo, woo, woo. Jesus coming back. Um, and it'll be, uh, we'll have someone in a mask and gloves serving it to you so you won't serve yourself and we'll have like individual packets of creamer and sugar and sweeteners and all that so you can do it all yourself and uh, I think wrap stirs and all that. So again, next Sunday we'll have coffee, Ryan will be preaching, but normally when I'm not preaching up here on a Sunday, the ministry I've committed to serve in is the kids' ministry. So back to the previous church I was at, I served with the kindergartners. I served in the five-year-old class. Sundays I wasn't preaching, I would be there and Often parents would drop their kids off and they see me rolling on the floor, you know, like playing with toys and all that with the kids. And they're like, oh, pastor, what are you doing out here? And I said, this is the mission I volunteer in. So I'm planning on doing the training and go through the background check and all that. And I'll start serving here with the kindergarten class. And I've seen this a lot of times when a parent will drop off a child for the very first time. And the child's bottom lip begins to quiver. And then as soon as mom or dad or both of them leave, the son or child, the little child, little Johnny, little Miriam begins to just weep and wail and cry. And this is what I've learned. I've learned this. I've said, hey, 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 Miriam, 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 stop crying. I said, in a little bit, in a little bit, we're going to go outside and play on the playground. Do you want to play on the playground? And they stop crying. Johnny, did you want to play on the playground? Okay, okay, I'll go play on the playground, right? They'll stop crying, and we'll go outside and play on the playground. We'll have some fun, play tag, and throw the ball around and stuff. Then we'll come back inside. And then all of a sudden, I can see that bottom lip begin to quiver again. (laughs) And they begin to tears start to come down their eyes. And I say, oh, Johnny, Miriam, no, 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 don't cry. In a little bit, just hold on. We're going to have snacks. Do you want a snack? Do you want a juice box and some crackers? And okay, okay, and they stop crying. And then I give them their little juice box and they put the straw in and I give them some crackers on a little paper towel and they're eating and stuff. They finish it and then we collect the trash and as soon as we collect the trash, little Johnny's lip begins to quiver again. I'm like, Johnny, 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 don't, don't cry, don't cry. 
I said, hey, just in a little bit, if you just hold on, we're going to do crafts. We're going to color. Do you want to color and do crafts? Okay, okay. And they'll stop crying. We'll get the crafts out and they'll color and they'll do the Bible lesson. They'll color something about the lesson and they'll put it on the wall and say, oh, Johnny, maybe you did a great job. And they're like, okay. And then they begin to quiver again and begin to start crying. And this is what happens. All of a sudden, someone appears in the doorway, mom or dad, and all the tears begin to dry up. And mom and dad scoops them up and picks them up, and the tears stop and the quivering stops. You know why? Because true hope has arrived. Because up until then, playing and having fun, that'll give them hope, but not hope that's lasting. Toys and games, that'll give them some hope, but not hope that's lasting. Good food and snacks, That'll give them some hope, but hope that's not going to last. Crass and fun, that's going to give them a little hope, but not hope that's lasting. Only when the one who's come to bring them home comes back does that give them the hope that they've been waiting for. Are y'all with me? And you know what? In this life that we live, you may have had an amazing Thanksgiving dinner, great meal, but don't put your hope in that meal. You may have a great family. You may have a lot of toys at home but don't put your hope in those toys. You may have great relationships and great friends and have a lot of fun in life, but don't put your hope in those things because those things have for hope, but the hope doesn't last. Advent is all about waiting for the second coming of Christ. As a reminder, he came the first time and he's coming back again to take us home so that our tears will dry up and our hope will one day be realized. Let's pray. God, the one who gives us hope is the gate, the narrow gate by which we enter through faith. So God, I pray in this very often discouraging world, in our broken world in which we see the news and just see days upon days upon days and days of a homicide every day in the city of Houston. In a broken world where sex is just a game and a tool. In a broken world with injustice, brokenness, selfishness. In a broken world where our appetite, our stomach is our God. In a broken world where our greed and our desire for more at any cost, God can sap us of joy and hope and courage. God, if we're going to walk on that narrow path, that walk of faith, to continue walking with our King, our Lord, Jesus Christ, God, we're going to experience pressure, stress, anxiety, persecution, mockery, being dissed. So God, I pray that we would commit to being a kingdom man, a kingdom woman, a kingdom teen. God, I just, I just think of how difficult it is to be a teenager who submitted to the King, to Jesus Christ, in every area of life on that narrow path when the path of destruction seems so fun and it's so wide and everyone seems like they're on it and enjoying it. God, I pray for our, our teens now, for our junior high students and our high school students. God, that they remain on that narrow path. God, I pray for our college students, even thinking about all the times, God, that I had to walk away from certain athletic parties and functions because it was heading towards things that I knew were unbiblical and experiencing ridicule and mockery. Boys will be boys and men will be men. God, I pray for our college students and our students, God. I pray for our singles, that they would stay on that narrow path in their vocation and in school. They would say submitted to Christ. They would seek first Christ's kingdom, his rule in their lives. God, I pray for the wives, the women in here as well, the mothers. God, I pray that as they say, I wanna be a kingdom woman. I wanna be devoted and dedicated to Jesus Christ in every area of my life, in my attitude, in my emotions. God, rather than choosing 
that wide path that seems so happy, that seems so fulfilling. God, would you give them the, the unction, the ability, the spirit empowerment to stay on that narrow path and encourage one another, God. It's, it's a discouraging walk at times. And God, I pray for the husbands, that they'd be kingdom men, that like Christ, they would lay down their lives, they would sacrifice their lives for their wife and their families. God, in a world full of selfishness and entitlement, God, would these men who walk this narrow path be marked by, life, uh, marked by a life of loving sacrifice? And God, when they feel like they're that airline passenger going against the flow to retrieve something from their seat, God, be their strength, God. Help us encourage one another. God, we're all on the same race, all headed for what you have in front of us, pursuing Jesus, to radically focus on Jesus. So help us encourage one another, God. Other Christians at work, other Christians at school. Encourage them through sitting down for a cup of coffee. Encouraging them through social media, through a text message, an email, a phone call. Because God, it can be so discouraging to do marriage your way, to do parenting your way, to treat our finances your way to look at biblical leadership and eldership your way. So Master, I pray that you help us not forsake gathering together and not forsake encouraging, putting courage into one another. And all the more, as we see that finish line, as we see Jesus Christ, who's coming back, God, help us to be excited even more then coffee coming back, that Jesus Christ, our King, our Savior, our lover and our Lord is coming back for us. Forgive us, God, for putting our hope in that vacation in a month to Boulder, Colorado, in that new thing we're gonna buy for Christmas, that new car, that new home. God, those things will give us temporary hope. Those toys and trinkets will give us a little bit of hope. Family and friends and a delicious meal will give us a little bit of hope. But God, only our hope in Jesus Christ and his, his coming back for us can give us eternal hope as we get discouraged and sad and frustrated and anxious when we're on this narrow path of pursuing him. So give us courage, God. Give us strength. Be our strength. And we ask all this in Christ's name, in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and all God's people said.